welcome to the Gottesdienst crowd, where we foster confessional integrity, liturgical preservation, and preaching that doesn't stink. We believe that the historic liturgy of the divine service is more than mere cobwebs of antiquity, but it is a true treasure of the Church to be dusted off and brought down from her attic to be enjoyed. So let's get dusting. Welcome back to the Godestine's Crowd. This is Jason Broughton. Today we have back with us after, you know, a long hiatus, uh, Dave Peterson. Welcome back, Dave. Thank you. Uh, are you tan, rested, and ready, or are you still recovering from all the presentations? I, I mean, I'm trying to, it doesn't feel like I had a hiatus at all. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we're looking yeah, at. I'm the, ready. Okay. We're looking at the gospel reading for the last Sunday of Trinity, the last Sunday of the church year. It comes from the gospel of Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 to 13. I'll read that in the English Standard Version. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Okay, so context, all of Matthew 25 are three parables about the second coming. And sometimes our Lord, when he is trying to make a point about a particular event, will give a number of parables that each one either builds upon another or gives uh, perhaps a, a, a unique facet of that particular teaching. Is there anything unique about this particular parable of the end that is being put on display as opposed to the parable of the talents and the parable of the sheep and the goats? And and, and maybe that I helps think so. us. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that right. helps us to really kind of zero in and say, this is kind of the point that Jesus is making. Right. I mean, maybe it's, it's helpful to see the similarities quick first, right? That it, all three parables have people damned and people saved, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you've only got one in the talents, but there's, there's definitely this distinction between believers and unbelievers. Um, and I think what's unique in the virgins is that all 10 of them fall asleep, that all 10 of them have virtue, they're virgins, and they all fall asleep, they all fail, uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, the unique thing, of course, is that five of them have oil, which which they're able to burn and display. And I think that's really faith and good works. And uh, the others had, five of them had virtue outwardly, but they weren't motivated by the right thing, right? They lack faith. And so mm. they appear virtuous, but they don't actually have, they're not actually performing real good works because they don't have faith. So there's nothing to burn. Whereas... Like in the talents, right? They, uh, how many are there in the talents? Is there five of them? I can't remember. Four of them. Yeah. Uh, I got my Greek New Testament. Let me look at this in English. It'll be faster. I can't remember. How many people get talents? And then, I, man, I, traveling far three country. Three people, like 10, five, and one? T uh, five, two, one. So, yeah, three. And then they get doubled. Okay. But yeah, I'm sorry. So, three people. So, one, th one out of three fails in the talents. Of course, half the people fail. I mean, we're not given in the sheep and the goats. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, there, you know, in the, the, the guy that buries the talent, he doesn't, he doesn't have the outwardness of anything. He's like fully bad. And the, and the goats are like fully bad as well. Anyway, mm -hmm. I think that's the distinction that they look good, but, but then even the ones that are good 
fail because they fall asleep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you get the right. The, the, sense, the, the, the sheep, the sheep the are just good. The, yeah, in the parable of the talents, you get the sense that they all believe the same thing, insofar as the master was a harsh man, but one saw it as an opportunity to um, to please the master. The other one saw it as uh, something to avoid, um, to just <laughs> give, really? give him you back think, what he you owned. Think the good ones, the good one, the the ones who make the investment. You think they think he's harsh? Well, I think they think he's a serious man. Like he expects them to do something with this. Oh, yeah. Uh, they feel an obligation. but I, Right. But I mean, I don't think they would say that he reaps where he hasn't sown. Okay. That, I mean, he's the, the third man accuses him of being, being uh, yeah, accuses him of being unjust. He doesn't, he doesn't think that, you know, right, he's too afraid to do anything. Whereas the other two, I mean, I, I agree with you that they think he's serious and they have an obligation to do something, but I wouldn't use the word harsh. Mm-hmm. Um, what do they, they don't, well, they don't talk. No, they don't, but they don't ever, the master condemns him with his own words. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Of if, course. If you, if yeah, you really does. believed I were harsh like that, then you could have at least put it in the bank to earn interest. Right. So, so like, I'm always thinking, that the others had a similar understanding that he was serious about this um, and that he expected a return and they saw it as an opportunity for, um, well, what, what did they, they see it as an opportunity for, for uh, maybe not coming into his good graces, well, put- but at least, <clears throat> at least receiving praise from this man who's serious. Yeah, I mean, they put to use what he gave them. So in, in the parable of the talents, right, the talents are faith. This is always cracks me up when people turn this into a stewardship text because it's an allegory, right? So mm-hmm. it's not about money. I mean, the money is just an, is, a, is a symbol. So this is about faith. They put, he gives them faith and they put it to use and their faith grows. And mm-hmm. I don't think that they're, I don't think that actually they take any risk at all. So it's not as though they do something, you know, like they might fail. Like, you know, I mean, if it was money, you might make an investment and you might lose all the money. There's, there's risk involved in that, but there's no risk involved in investing in your faith. I mean, in, in putting your faith into action in, right. Taking your faith seriously and your faith growing. So in any, any case, the, (laughs) there's they, they they don't they don't fail in any way right the the two that make the investment they don't fail and there's really nothing good in the one who does fail mm-hmm. and i would say the same thing of the sheeps and goats whereas these virgins they all look the same in some ways and they and yet they all fail but then because they fall asleep they don't keep watch but then there is this mercy the warning cry and and then we see that in fact they have faith and they do good works. Yeah. The the yeah, the the servants are expected to have some sort of growth, at least in the parable of the talents, right? That faithfulness is right. not just giving right. back to him what was given, but that there is right. some sort of um managing of it in in a way that is faithful to what the desires of the master are. Yeah. I mean, almost you could, I wonder if the parable of the talents, I never thought of this before, but I wonder if it's kind of a corrective to the virgins. It does follow because you could get maybe the wrong idea from the virgins that you could hoard your faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so I wonder if maybe the, maybe the talents is sort of a corrective. I'm not saying that you should just fall asleep and just light your faith at the last second. And right. Right. uh, Maybe, maybe that's a, Maybe there's some correlation there. Yeah. And then you get the 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 sheep and the goats, and it's like, let's not think that it, this is, that good works are uh, not included in faith. Yeah. I mean, th- right. that, that there is an action that goes along with this, uh, that what comes, that what's in the heart comes out. So what's in the heart? Right. And it doesn't, it doesn't just stay there. It's not buried. Right. So is that something you'd want to bring out in, 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 
in covering this parable that so that the rest of the parables aren't missed? I mean, you could, you could do it for sure. I mean, I think the parables are the other two parables are well enough known. I don't think mm-hmm. you'd have to read the whole thing. I think no. you could, you know, you could do that. I, I think though, mm-hmm. there's the the fact that they burn the oil. I think matters, right? They don't. It's not just that they have the oil. Um, I mean, it is that, of course, but then th- there is faith in action that they go to meet the bridegroom with their lamps burning, and if oil is faith, which it is, I th- then I think that this actually lighting the lamp is good works. That the um, their real virtue is the exercise of faith, not maybe what the world sees. Mm-hmm. So why Does do you say the again, oil is faith? Um, you know, throughout the Old Testament, the oil is kind of seen as the spirit. So why would you, is that primarily the spirit's work? Is that the connection you're making? Yeah, I wouldn't make, I mean, I, I'm, if you want to say it's the spirit, fine. I mean, I don't know that how to even distinguish, not that, not that faith is the Holy Spirit, but I mean, right, we believe it's the work of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in us. Um, but I mean, the Holy Spirit then is also the flame, right? So I would want to make the distinction kind of doctrinally between faith and good works as the oil and the lamp, or I mean, the burning. And of course, the Holy Spirit is driving all of this. To be sure, um, the difference between the foolish and the wise is the wise have the Holy Spirit and the, and the foolish don't, right? Right. So yeah. um, I would say the Spirit's kind of both of these things the oil and the flame, but I would, I would want to make the flame because the flame's visible. The flame is the oil being put to use. This is what the oil is for. There is a sense in which what faith is for is, is for good works. I mean, faith receives the forgiveness of sins, right? So we tend to think of it as, you know, the purpose of faith is to save us, you know, a sola fide, which is obviously a reality, but that's, I mean, there is a sense in which faith that grasps a whole, grasps the gospel, receives the gospel, and receives this forgiveness of sins, isn't sort of thinking about how that's beneficial to itself, right? Mm-hmm. It's you know, faith isn't thinking about uh, oh, this is great, I get saved. I mean, faith is thinking about praising God and acting out in acts of mercy and love toward the neighbor. Mm-hmm. The purpose of faith is works in a sense. Yeah. But it's also to see I mean, the I, bridegroom, isn't it? I mean, it's the yeah, desire to right, be well, with him. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that's the praise aspect of it. I, mm-hmm. uh, I, I really have been moving more and more towards praise in, in the last five or six years. I, yeah, I think for a long time, I avoided praise or thinking about praise. I only want to talk about confession because you know, praise just seemed like such a mewling, weak thing, the way that it's so often been used in our context, in our circles. But I think we need to, you know, I'm not talking about this kind of, you know, um, erotic, self, you know, focused, emotional experience of, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. ecstatic joy, uh, a kind of praise. I'm talking about praise like it is in the Psalter, which which is confession. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's more than, I mean, confession, the problem with the word confession is is it's too, uh, it's too esoteric, it's too intellectual. Um, It comes across that way in our, in our day. And praise brings mm -hmm. with it the joy attending the confession of the mighty works of God in the past. Right. And, and, it, right, see, exactly. It is an emotional it, word. Yeah, it, it it is content. I mean, the the contents, the confession, but there is a joy attendant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't sing his confession; you sing his praise, and that praise is a confession. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's that's beautifully said. Yes, exactly. I like that. You don't sing his confession. Yeah, you are confessing him in your praise, though. Right. So that's good. Right. Yeah. Um, and th- that is something, uh, you know, I, historically within Lutheranism, like the the Orthodox, the period of Orthodoxy versus then the uh, the time of Pietism. That was a you know a major thing, wasn't it? A major thing of discussion that the Pietists thought were was lacking, and not completely wrong in their uh, 
their diagnosis of that, right? Uh, I think you're right. I think that's completely accurate. I mean, we always mm-hmm. should pay attention to the criticisms of our enemies. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, it could just be ad hominem attacks. And sometimes, obviously, it is. But usually there's something to it, I would say. Right. So it's important that we be, if we're going to actually be Christian men, that we would actually consider what they say and not simply dismiss it. And, you know, so, yeah, I think there was a pietism was a response to, to things that were real and should have been mm-hmm. corrected. It's just that it went too far or yeah, exactly. have the kind of a misemphasis. Right. Mm-hmm. And now, I mean, the problem is we have the opposite. We've kind of, you know, responded to pietism. As though I don't, I just don't think pietism is a is a real alive threat within the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. I don't see it. Um, I mean, at least not classic pietism. For example, I don't see a problem with people over preparing for Holy Communion, um, you know, and waiting to take communion until they're till they've made themselves worthy. I, I mean, maybe there's somebody doing that somewhere in the Missouri Synod, but I'm not seeing it. Um, no, or, but you do. You do have like the 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 modern evangelical movement kind of grasping on to the reaction of pietism to Lutheran orthodoxy and Methodism, uh, which places so so much on subjective feeling versus the objective uh, statements that the Bible make. Uh, And so you do have that. And I think that's still Yes, you do have that. Oh, Um, yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that's when, when people say, you know, they didn't get anything out of worship, right? right? I mean, typically what they mean was, I didn't have a mountaintop experience. I didn't, you know, I didn't feel the Holy Spirit. I wasn't swept away. And mm-hmm. yeah, no, I think that's right. But I think that's Methodism, not pietism. Yeah. and But I mean, I'm, Methodism so. is swirling around the same time as as Spainer and Franke. Is it? Only in England. I thought it was later. Okay. I mean, not much well, later, if if it is. I guess I'm thinking of the <clears throat> uh, uh, the Second Great Awakening, you know, the Finney, Finneyism and, and the stuff that kind of comes out of the Methodist yeah. itinerant preachers in America. But yeah, I mean, I don't mean there aren't, yeah. But anyway, I don't think that's kind of classic Protestantism exactly. They're not, they're not given to ecstatic uh, praise and emotions, are they? I I may have no expert in pietism. I'm not an expert in pietism either. I'm just saying (laughs) it it does. That was not their emphasis in ecstatic, but it was on personal subjective. Like they, they, they probably wouldn't have said you have to have this kind of feeling, but the idea was you probably should, right? You well, yeah, but it should be based on the objective. Yeah, but it probably would have been, if there was an emphasis on feelings, it seems like it would have been more on dour feelings, right? More on feelings of unworthiness and I don't know. I mean, I, I wasn't, a, oh, yeah, I wasn't, when I said I wasn't a, a expert in pietism, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to point out that you weren't either. You you probably, you might w- very well know more about it than I do. It's what I meant. So I'm not, uh, anyway. <laughs> Uh, uh, well, the pietism it, it, was, in the to end, be sure, a, a response. Yeah. So, uh, but this is this is that ongoing um, whole council of God thing, right? Where pastors yeah, need to keep in right. mind what you know where their congregation is, and you can sometimes see this. I see it in 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 myself or in uh, in the people I serve. You know, when they don't. Re- sometimes they don't like the Luther hymns because they sound so dour to them or they're not as happy. And so that's kind right. of a, a strain of that that comes out of that, the, the, the focus on subjective feelings instead of what is ex- objectively, um, how are yeah. we praising God with these words and, uh, and recognizing the joy that you can, even if the tune sounds you know, like it's a minor key to you. I think the other thing is that there's there's more nuance and depth to joy than just simply happy excitement. Right. Um, yeah, and I think one of the so I, I mean I think that you know that's often when they're saying you know that this this hymn isn't joyful. 
um, you know, what do they really mean? They just mean, you know, this isn't, this doesn't have the same kind of exuberance and over the top obviousness of say Isaac Watts joy to the world. And Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I think that's a great hymn and I think there's a place for that. Um, But uh, you know, I think that there's more to be said and more to be done. And I think that the Luther hymns are so much more profound textually that, and so much more nuanced and precise that they require music that's capable of carrying that. And Mm -hmm. I think rather than dismiss it because it doesn't meet the sort of happy excitement standard, maybe we ought to learn to, to think about the words more and let that drive the joy and the kind of joy that we have. I, I always, uh, it's, it's, I always use the same example, but it's like when people complain that, um, Lutherans, Missouri Synod doesn't, uh, you know, they're not happy when they come back from Holy Communion because nobody smiles. So they're like, shouldn't, you know, if you receive Holy Communion, you should smile on the way back to the pew. How come nobody smiles? There's something wrong. Well, I mean, there could be something wrong if nobody smiles. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you, you know, smiling isn't the only way to express joy. And also sometimes joy doesn't feel like happy excitement. The The way that you receive the joy that you have at Holy Communion, you know, the day after your mother dies is a little bit different than the day after you baptize your grandchildren. I mean, there's just, mm. th- th- there's a reality here, I think, that is being, you know, has just been kind of leveled off and, and we've lost all the nuance and, and the like. And I think yeah. Luther's hymns and, the, and Gerhardt's hymns and the, you know, the really great hymnody of Christendom, it, it, it's just much more kind of complicated and it requires more effort and work on behalf of the singer in terms of not only melodically, but also intellectually, that you allow yourself to actually let the music be interpretive of the words instead of just, you know, before you even get there, telling it what it has to be. Mm. Yeah. So in terms of translation, then, any issues? Uh, well, you know, I like the tra- I like translating that, that word wise, phronimoi, um, but it's not the word Sophia in Greek. Mm-hmm. And, and I just wonder about that uh, because it has more of the, it's more like discerning. Mm-hmm. It's more, it's more of a, it's um, yeah. I don't know. Wisdom, wisdom has, Sophia has to me, maybe I'm wrong on this, but I, I think of wisdom as a more, a more spiritual gift, a more, mm-hmm. right. Like this, like the Proverbs, you know, whereas this is uh, this is like calculating. Yeah. You Clever. get that in Luke 16, know. right? Um, that uh, the unjust steward, he's called Fronius. Uh, right, um, right, right. But then you, also, you, but then you so, also get in the parable of the, the building on the sand versus the rock. Everyone who does, uh, hears and does these words of mine is like a wise builder who builds on the rock. Um, and that's so, Phronimos also? Yeah, Phronimos, yeah. Phronimos, um, yeah. Okay. And then uh I I think it pops up again um in yeah in Matthew 24 uh verse 45 uh who, who then, then is, is the faithful, faithful and, wise and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time. So the the one who takes directions and is faithful and uh hears the word and acts upon that word, right? Not just buries it, um, right? but takes it to heart and, um, and prepares uh, for action to, to do something with the, with what has been communicated. So it's kind of like a, a receiving and then actively responding. Right. Yeah. I want, where is the word Sophia used? <laughs> I didn't look that up. Uh, in the gospel? Right. Yeah, I didn't look it up either. I mean, that might be worth uh well, we didn't do it, but maybe we can do it before we preach. I don't Well, in any case, wise here, right? They're they're um they're all those things that you said, uh but they're still weak enough to fall asleep and to fail mm-hmm. to keep watch. So, Yeah. It's a beautiful but picture, it, I think. But it's almost it's almost like they knew it. Like so, they took it to heart 
all of Jesus' words that you're not strong enough. You're not, you can't rely upon yourself. And so they had a preparation to recognize that we're not going to be able to stay awake. We're not going to be able to. It's a, oh. it's a taking to heart what is there. And so it's, it's, so it's kind of like, uh, you know, the difference, the, 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 the Aristotelian mean between excess and defect that, you know, could you say the foolish virgins are those who are, have an excess of like, it's, it's not based really on the word. It is just based on emotion. And so like, oh no, I'm ready. I can do this. It's great. Uh, whereas the, the wise, it, they've based their actions on what God has actually revealed to them. And so they go forward knowing I'm fully capable of, of, uh, of failing here, of falling asleep. Kind of like the, you know, the, when you give marriage counseling to people and you're like, look, both of you are totally capable of committing adultery given the right circumstances. And so make preparations so that you don't find yourself in those situations. Um, Right. And that's wisdom, right? That's a a zeal. That's a a, a cunning, uh, a a taking action based on the word that has been given to you. Yeah. And maybe I'm going the wrong way with this, but I... No, I'm, I think it's good. I mean, they they must these these five foolish. They must have had oil, right? I mean, it, I, presumably they had oil. They knew what these lamps were for, and they had, you know, foolishly burned it all because they didn't think it really mattered, or they didn't think the bridegroom was really coming. They gave up hope at some point. There's no reason to save oil; he's never coming. Whereas, or they the, weren't the listening. Five, that you don't know the day or time. Yeah, right. So they they were uh and they right, they think they'll be they'll have time to go get some if they need it. They're just right, they they uh presume upon his his grace or his his goodness um rather than wanting to actually be prepared. Whereas the other five, they do fall asleep, but you know, they've realized that they've got to hold on. He is coming and they're going to need this oil. Um mm-hmm. and they want to light their lamps. They want to do their job. They want to be, you know, these bridesmaids that Usher him or acolyte. They're really like acolytes. Yeah. They, <laughs> want be, they want to be faithful. This is your best argument for girl acolytes. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> but yeah, because that's what they're doing. They're they're ushering him in. You know, uh, lighting the path into the bridal chamber. Though what's great is uh, that that's a nice surprise at the end of this parable is that they went into the bridal chamber. <laughs> right? I never They're not that. supposed to do that. Uh, right? What are they doing in there? <laughs> this is a more complicated wedding than it first appeared, right? Um, they get really kind of they get they're they're not just they're not just the bridesmaids, they become the bride. Mm. But yeah, so they and that's what they want. That. And that's what they <laughs> Yeah, that's a little graphic, but it's true. <laughs> I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just saying I don't even know how I would how I would go there without it becoming weird. I mean, you don't have to I I think you I mean it's in the text. I mean, they go in. You don't have to say what goes on in there. Just that, you know, they <laughs> become the bride. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a it's a biblical it's a very biblical image and it's it's a I mean, what do you think communion is? I know. But so you know, the people also don't like hearing that side of it. <laughs> no, I don't. I know. <laughs> but there is there is a goodness though in it though. Um, so I don't. I mean, I yeah. You know, if you, I don't know. It might be awfully distracting if you're not careful. Uh, but anyway, what were you going to say? What were we saying? Oh yeah. So uh, uh, here's this. I think what's another thing to point out that I think goes along with that third parable: the sheep and the goats, and that is that right. So I think we should see virginity not literally, uh, but as a as an allegory for virtue. That they that these all ten of them are outwardly virtuous and they look the same, but of course five of them don't have faith, even though they're outwardly virtuous. Mm-hmm. They have different motives, reasons for being virtuous. So what matters in the end is faith, right? That's the distinction. Uh, those who are saved have faith. At the same time, notice that there aren't 
there, there's none of them aren't virgins. So it's possible to be virtuous and not have faith. It's not possible to have faith and not be virtuous. Uh, and I think that's maybe something worth talking about because sometimes like when we get to, uh, you know, the, the parable of the, the vineyard workers or I'm trying to think, or the repentant thief or other places, you know, we, we sort of act as the, right, the good and the bad, right? The parable of the wedding banquet, uh, you know, we sort of act as though, uh, you know, since anybody can be saved and Jesus died for everybody, you know, the worst dirt bag in the world can just stroll right in. And there's a context in which that's true, that there's no one for whom there's no one that hasn't been reconciled to the father in the death of the son. There's no one that mm -hmm. Jesus hasn't paid for, no one that he doesn't want. That's all completely true. And all it takes is a smoldering wick. So the repentant thief can, in some sense, stroll right in. At the same time, um, you know, there is the, uh, it, it would not be true that the that if the repentant thief somehow, if Jesus would have decided to heal him instead of just bringing him into paradise that day, and the, he would have gone on living his life would have been different, right? The gospel mm -hmm. actually does change us. And, and, and so these virgins are all outwardly virtuous. But we shouldn't judge on the basis of that, as that's what makes people saved. But we should recognize that those who have faith will have evidence of it in their lives. Okay. So, and that comes out in the sheep and the goats too. The, the, right. sheep, the sheep don't count on it. They don't rely upon it. In fact, I think it makes them uncomfortable. Right. Wait a minute. Uh, this isn't. This is not going the way we thought. Um, but but Jesus gives them credit for their good works. Mm -hmm. Their works do follow them. Yeah, their works matter. Okay. Yeah. So, any other issues in translation? Uh, no. Okay. I mean, it's pretty so, straightforward. These narratives aren't hard to translate. Um. All right. So then, in terms of fivefold use. Well, I, I got a couple particular... other things I want. To let, well, a few, but I want to. I think uh, the midnight thing is important, right? Uh, first of all, the fact that a call comes is an act of mercy, right? He could have just tiptoed past them. He actually mm -hmm. gives them a chance. There is a warning. A cry goes out. Um, we get to fivefold use. Like, I think that's of great comfort. This is kind of like uh, uh, God in the garden after the fall. Where are you? Yeah. Come to me. Yeah. Right. Even though he knows. Yeah. Uh, the, the Passover happened at midnight. So I think there's a connection there. The, the uh, angel of the Lord comes and takes the firstborn of all the houses not covered with blood in Exodus 12. Samson uh, takes the gates off of Gaza to the hill facing Hebron at midnight. They Remember, they'd laid an ambush for him. And mm -hmm. I think that's... Samson's in some ways, I mean, other than, you know, his, his cry for faith for water and then his cry for faith at the end to die and, and to begin the deliverance from the Philistines, that, that taking off of the gates of Gaza is kind of his best moment, even though I, I mean, he was there with the prostitute, so that's not so great. But he doesn't touch <laughs> any dead bodies. He doesn't break the Nazarite vow in, in the Gaza scene. Um, he he lays kind of waste to their city. He leaves them vulnerable to attack because they've lost their defenses, but he does it without. So anyway, that's kind of interesting, I think. So the midnight stuff. Um, in Mark chapter 13, uh, Jesus tells them to watch because they don't know when the end is coming. And one of the times listed is midnight. I mean, in the evening, at midnight, or in the morning. So those are the sort of watch hours, but in Luke 11, if you go to your friend at midnight and tell him you need bread to host a guest, he won't listen to you. But if you're persistent, you can bug him into doing it. So that's at midnight. And then in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are in prison praying and singing, and it's at midnight that the earthquakes and the doors open. So you've got a very eschatological thing there with the midnight thing, which is probably obvious, but I... The biblical stuff, I don't know. You could work. You could do something with that in a in a good way. I think in a sermon. Mm -hmm. All What's right, you the, want to go to fivefold use. Um, bringing up the midnight thing. Wh what's the introit for Christmas Eve midnight? 
Oh, when all when was all still was, and it was midnight. Yeah. Is that, is, is that from, that's not, that's a liturgical text, right? That's not. Yeah. It's a, somewhere in the Apocrypha. I, I've looked at it before, but I don't remember, right? In fact, it's something remember. like the word leaped, the word leaped down or something, right? When all was still and it was midnight. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, that is a kind of, um, that's a legend, you know, at midnight on Christmas Eve, still to this day, the animals can talk, right? Do you know about really? that? Really? No, yeah. I've never heard this. Yeah, that's uh, that's some, I don't know where, I mean, it's this idea that, right, Jesus was born at midnight and the animals accepted him, you know, in the stable or whatever. And so there's like this echo through the ages that at midnight for one hour, animals can talk on Christmas Eve. So there is this idea that uh, mid- Jesus was born at midnight anyway. I mean, I'm- That's great. Yeah. I've never heard an animal. I know. I, I would be. It's a, it's a fun thing. I wonder if um, I wonder if that has any correspondence in in the Narnia stuff. If this idea of animals talking, I just thought of that. I wonder if there is something very. I've. I mean, I can remember as a child. I love those Richard Scary books. I love talking animals as a child. I mean, I uh, guess I still like talking animals, but. <laughs> Yeah, but, I, I mean, mean the it, only it, I wonder. I, I never thought familiar with, in terms of talking animals, were the uh, yeah the Chronicles of Narnia. Well, I mean, I mean, you have a lot of. I mean, you have the a Watership Down, right? The ra- they, they, the rabbits talk, oh, yeah. and the other animals talk. Um, mm-hmm. There's actually lots of them. Those uh, Stuart yeah. Little, you got, you know, my. Um, well, anyway, I, I I just thought of that. I wonder if because the idea of. The idea of animals being able to talk is that they'd finally, I mean, at midnight, is they'd finally be able to confess. They'd, have, they'd, they'd, they'd receive something of the image of God that they don't have if they had words. Yeah. Well, anyway, but I, it just reminded me of that with the Christmas Eve uh, antiphon. I don't remember the whole thing. When, when all was still and it was midnight is how it starts. But Yeah, I, I'd, I'd have to look it up. Well, you have again, though, this idea of uh, even Christmas Eve itself, even the birth of Jesus is both, it's, it's, it's law or gospel, judgment or deliverance based upon how you receive it, right? Just like the mm-hmm. angel of the Lord that, that passes over those marked with the lamb, lamb's blood, but kills the, right? If you're marked by the, if you're marked by the blood of the lamb, this is the beginning of deliverance. You know, the next day you're going to go start walking towards the Red Sea and the promised land. But if you, if you don't have the blood of the lamb, you don't have faith, you're destroyed. Right. So this mid, this midnight is the dividing line. Oh, this is good. I like this. Yeah, there you go. In fact, that's what the word means, right? It's the division of the night. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really, it's, if it's the middle, right? You're, you're on the, the sun is rising now as opposed yeah. to, as opposed to it getting darker, it's beginning to get lighter. That's why the vigils are at midnight. Mm-hmm. It's so it's when all was still and it was midnight. Mm-hmm. Your almighty word, O Lord, descended from the royal throne. Oh, descended! I thought. I think. Yeah, I thought there was something about jumping. And then it just goes into Psalm two. Okay. But it in our it doesn't list where it's from, in in our proper. No, they never do because they're embarrassed. Yeah, they're embar- They don't want to tell you because. You might look it up and read the Apocrypha. I don't remember where it's from. Um, I don't remember it. the context actually being that interesting. I, mm. um, yeah, I don't know. Well, that, but that uh, would we be should probably to go through the, the midnight stuff and, and, and talk about that. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I think it's, it's interesting how, so the great hymn for this, right? The wake awake for night is flying. It's hilarious how, they really make the make this whole thing a much nicer thing than the actual parable, right? Because <laughs> in the parable, right, five of them are locked out, and I never knew you. But but in the hymn, it's all positive. Uh, wake, awake, for night is flying. The watchmen on the heights are crying. Awake, Jerusalem, arise. Midnight hears the welcome voices, and at the thrilling cry rejoices. Or where are ye, ye virgins wise? The bridegroom comes awake. No, no nothing about where are ye ye virgins foolish, right? Yeah. Um, so you've got this sort of just really nice, and then Zion hears, right? 
and all her heart with joy is springing. She wakes, she rises. Um, it's kind of uh, it's kind of interesting how that hymn just takes the positive, which I'm not against at all. I mean, it's uh, right. you know it's it's putting it's putting us into that context and recognizing that we're the five wise virgins, and if we aren't. What are we doing here? Why are we, why would we be singing this hymn? So, mm-hmm. is is there a, any um, uh, symbolism to the five? You know, the Pentateuch or something like that. Pentateuch or the or the five senses. Um, yeah, probably. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think that uh, uh, the Pentateuch is the stronger one, but the five senses sort of would have this idea of being uh, the the sort of fullness uh, of humanity, but then 10 Mm -hmm. gets at that too. Um, You also, of course, have the 10, then, I mean, the totality of these virgins are the 10 commandments, but they can't come in by the 10 commandments. They have to come in by the five books of Moses. Right. That's good. I don't, I mean, you could, yeah, I mean, you could, you know, because the five books of Moses are, are the gospel, right? The Torah, the law, but, Mm -hmm. you know, not in the narrow sense. So, I mean, you could, yeah, you got to be a little careful with that stuff, but I mean, it would need some caveats and a little explanation, but I think there's, I do think there's something to it that there's a correspondence here of this being the fullness, um, the fullness of humanity in some sense, but then, I mean, it's just this, it's, I mean, all three of these parables, not everyone is saved. The mm-hmm. salvation is for everyone, but not everyone is saved. That's just a kind of cold, hard truth that, I think is a particularly difficult u- uh, truth for our age. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I'm yeah. I'm finding you know a real resistance to the to the reality of eternal damnation. That's just like impossible. You think about it. I or, um, you know, at the time of the Reformation, people were people really believed there was a hell, and they were afraid of it for themselves and for their relatives. Mm-hmm. And I just I think our culture. Even within the church in America, it's a hard sell. People just, they can't believe their own, you know, their own children would be, their own children couldn't go to hell. It just wouldn't be possible. They can't imagine themselves going to hell or anyone they love or anyone they even know, right? Mm -hmm. It's the sort of, I I call this the public school phenomena where uh, public schools in America are just terrible, but the local school is always good. <laughs> it's the exception, right? It's always the local school. And, and why is that? Well, because I know, I mean, I know the people that, you know, teach there. I went there. Look how well educated I am. You know, it was good enough for my kids. I mean, and but it's like, right, there's always this idea that somehow the local the local public school, those teachers, even though they went to the same state university as the bad schools, they somehow didn't get indoctrinated. And and I'm not, I don't trying to condemn every public school teacher, but I think we should recognize what, you know, that are, we're, mm-hmm. we're blind to the kind of local situation because of natural affections that we have for people that we actually know. And we're kind of disgusted by public schools elsewhere because, Right, it's a kind of xeno xenophobia, but it's also because we're not going to make excuses for those people. Mm-hmm. So anyway, the um, the I yeah. So even though they look good on the outside, even though you love them, right? Your love is not the standard of salvation. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know what? What these people need, what we all need, right, is faith. And the question is, do these people have faith? And how would we know they have faith? Well, they would they would light that oil and we would see it. And what 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 would it look like? It would look like going to church. I mean, that right. would be the most foundational thing I would say that they are connected to the means of grace, right? Where are they praising God? Um, you know, this idea that I know that they're good deep down. I know that he has faith in his heart even though his life denies it and even though his words deny it. I mean, I think that's, you know, we're, it's not our place to judge and decide who has faith or not in the end. And I, I'm not, tr- I, of course, right? We, we're we're going to keep praying for people and keep hoping. But, you know, let's not make bold assertions about the faith of people whose lives and words deny their faith. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you want to say, 
you know, I'm holding God to his word and I'm reminding him hourly that he baptized my son and that he made this promise and that Jesus didn't die in vain. And please, please, please bring him back to the faith. That's a good confession. And I think that's a pious confession. Uh, that's much better than just insisting that, you know, my son, no matter what he does and no matter what he says and no matter how he lives, is just somehow loved by God apart from grace, apart from faith and the like. Yeah. You know, that's that, that's a, a, a good way forward. Um, so that could be, you know, one uh, refutation, right? That this yeah. has life yeah, in the right. church. Yeah. Uh, you could probably I'll talk take about a drunk. the end times. Yeah. What's that? I was going to say, I mean, I, a person that's struggling, a person that struggles with addiction or struggle, I'll take a drunk that comes to church over over uh, a person who looks righteous on the outside and doesn't come to church. Right? I mean, the real, the real burning of the oil is got to be this reception of the, of the means of grace, doesn't it? That's mm-hmm. the, that's because, because the virgins all look good outwardly. What's the burning light? I mean, it, it yeah. can be lots of things. It could be helping people. It could be giving, you know, money to the public library as a donation. It could be, you know, doing all sorts of things. But but it's got to be foundationally confessing Christ, right? Praising yeah. God with his people, receiving the means of grace. That's That's got to be the the core of that light. All right. So, yeah, sorry. well, and the, the dealers, uh, I mean, would those be the pastors? The, the the places yeah. where the word and sacrament are actually given out. The, you got to go to the place where yeah. this is given out. That's right. It's not given out at the public library or at the animal shelter or right. Mm-hmm. I mean, those those might be acts of faith that they do, but that's not where you get it. Right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, so what's the, where do you want to go? Do you want to talk about doctrine, training in righteousness, sure. correction, comfort? Let's. I mean. Well, doctrine, certainly faith and works is at play here. So we talked about that. And I mean, that is a distinction that has to continually be made with nuance and articulated because it is it is easy to become confused on it in various ways. So mm-hmm. that's one. You already brought up the eschaton, um, you know, just again, the kind of reality of damnation mm-hmm. and the seriousness of this uh, and therefore the sort of need for evangelism, but also for teaching. Um, You know, it's like the, there is this false idea that we're going to keep the faith by good works, right? So Jesus, Jesus died for us and he's forgiven us, but now, you know, if we're going to make it our faith, we'll do it by good works and our good works will strengthen our faith. And that's actually false. That's really kind of the Roman Catholic view. Uh, But there is something to be asked about how do we keep this faith? And it's it's not by the merit of our works, but uh, there is this necessity to actually exercise faith by, as you already brought up, right, being in the being where the oil is given, and uh, so there is this correct admonition to watching. And again, like, how do you watch? You don't watch by staying awake all night and praying. Uh, there might be times to do that, but you watch again by. Right, having this faith fed through forgiveness through through the means of grace. Um, so, what is the eschaton? How do we prepare for it? Is a is I don't know if that's maybe that should go under correction or uh, what's the other one? Rebuke, but or I don't know doctrine, whatever. Sure. Uh, another doctrine. Oh, the Isaiah sixty five reading is uh, about the new heavens and the new earth. So you could uh, pull out your uh, Jeff Gibbs voice, you know, and uh, he does have some good stuff about that. He, I didn't look at his commentary. I mean, I have read his commentary on this chapter before, but I didn't read it immediately. So I don't know if he talks about it in this section of his Matthew commentary, but, you know, that's that's in Isaiah 65. And that is a place, again, where people are confused. So it could be sort of correction as well, right? Um you know, we're not going to become angels, but we're also not going to become bodiless beings that are faceless in heaven. There is this promise of this new of this new heaven and this new earth. Even though we don't know exactly what that means, we know something, that it means that our bodies will be raised, that it means we'll be perfected, and so forth. 
And, you know, that goes, a, it, it's just a doctrinal thing in some sense, but it has, of course, a lot of implications for how we treat our bodies and how we treat the bodies of our loved ones who have departed in the sign of faith. And it also, I think, does something to be a kind of antidote against something like online communion, right? Mm. Um, we would never, nobody would have ever thought that you could have communion online if he knew what a human being was. Uh, the problem <laughs> was when, when the, it's true, because what happened was we were living in a kind of society and culture where we, we mistakenly got this idea that human beings could be reduced to sort of just intellect and then even, you know, just to, to bits that could be sort of broadcast down a telephone wire. And, you know, we, we, we sort of forgot that we, that we live in space, that we're physical beings and, and the like. So, you know, there, there's, there's applications of this that aren't necessarily immediately obvious. That's, I think, sort of an interesting thing. Sometimes when we're talking about doctrine, especially when we're not talking about Christology, right, or soteriology, when we're talking about things like anthropology or other sorts of things, it can seem as though it's just sort of, it's not the doctrine upon which the church stands or falls, right? It's not justification, and therefore, you know, it's sort of trivial, and it's it's not that big a deal. But it always is a big deal. If it's in the Bible, it matters. And there's there's implications for how we live our lives and what it is to be, right? Because if you don't have the right anthropology, you don't have the right Christology because Jesus is a man. I mean, it's right. always connected. Mm -hmm. So, um, comfort. I now I've always kind of taken it that the bridegroom comes, that this is the comfort mm. that's put out. Um, so many, you know, as you're waiting and as we wait, that seems to be what we struggle with. You know why? Um, you know, why do the the righteous or why do the wicked prosper? And why, what, what does it seem like your people are constantly under attack? And here, like the consolation is he does come. Right. He does come. There will be vindication. You will be taken into the bridal chamber, even if you don't want to think about that too much. But uh, <laughs> right. No, I, I think it is. It is. That is the, he keeps his word, right? He is mm. trustworthy. What he said happens, and and he comes in mercy, right? He's not coming to. I mean, though it does. His purpose in coming is to get the five wise. I mean, what happens in correspondence with that is the goats are sent to the place prepared for the demons, right? And you know these five foolish are going to be shut out. But his purpose in coming, his motivation in coming, is to get to get us. So. That is absolutely should be comforting. But I also think it's very comforting that there's a warning, right? I mean, so you could also mm -hmm. think of, you know, the rooster crowing three mm -hmm. times and the court of Caiaphas. You know, what a, what a actually, uh, you know, even though that's that rooster crowing is a sign of judgment, it's also, it's also a, an opportunity to repent, right? The, the rooster crows mm -hmm. in mercy. And Peter responds beautifully. The Holy Spirit works through that to call him back to the faith because he sees Jesus' word be, words being fulfilled. And, right? I mean, so the, the, the warning is, is just such a beautiful thing, mm -hmm. even though it, it's embarrassing maybe because you get busted. Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but it's, it's yeah, but thank God, you know, that we have the chance to respond then and, and to be woken up. So I think you could do something here. It's, it's, it's consoling, it's comforting. It also, maybe we need to rethink a little bit about how we feel about the law and law preaching, mm. because it's actually an act of mercy that's driven by Christ's compassion because he loves us enough to actually tell us, right? Yeah. He doesn't, even though, even though he says he comes like a thief in the night, right? And no one knows when he comes, there's sort of a wink, wink thing going on yeah. because there's this warning and we do know he's coming. And then we'll have in first Thessalonians that, you know, some, some will be awake when he comes, you know, that, I mean, yeah. I, that means they haven't died. Also, I, I mean, there will be those that will, you know, receive it in faith. I, I think even at the crucifixion, there are believers. I mean, the, I think there are probably people in Jerusalem, maybe not many, 
but you know, let's say Simeon, if he's still alive, or uh, Zacchaeus, or the Syrophoenician woman, or you know, whoever, or the centurion that had his faith praised, who they don't understand exactly what's happening maybe in all of its details and know, but they're confident that Jesus is doing the right thing and is saving them, right? And it is mm-hmm. making an atonement for their sins. And they're not like the, um, you know, it's not like the everybody, you know, I mean, the disciples fail and obviously the high, the priests are evil and, you know, the mob gets carried away, but there are these, the quiet in the land who mm-hmm. I don't think that we should see them. I don't think you should imagine Zacchaeus and Simeon and the Syrophoenician woman standing, you know, on the pavement yelling, crucify him. Mm-hmm. So that's good. Yeah, that's a good point. Right. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I mean, you know, now, I mean, those people are extraordinary in some sense, but I don't think we should discount their, the reality. And, you know, we might know some people like that. Um, you know, these, these really impressive people, quiet people with faith. I doubt any of them are in the office of the ministry. Uh, you know, we're, we're more like the disciples, but I mean, really seriously, but I do think that the real heroes are going to be these, again, you know, the Syrophoenician woman, the centurion, somewhat, somewhat unexpected. And the Mm -hmm. people that just quietly go about with, you know, in faith, in hope, right. In this eager expectation of the end and, you know, not needing any earthly reward for it at all. Uh, you know, the Mm -hmm. widow with her might would be another one. Any sermons you'd suggest reading uh, in in preparation of this? Um, anything that you recall that you've read in the past that was really helpful in you know demonstrating how to uh, handle the allegory of this, or demonstrating how to handle uh, a particular doctrine? Anything that you'd suggest them to to look at? Oh, that is such a good question. And I am so embarrassed that I cannot, that is, that's a, to my shame, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's a great question though. Um, (laughs) I mean, the hymn, you could read, uh, if you've got it, it's expensive, but you know, that hymn companion for Mm -hmm. uh, LSB, Denzer wrote the thing for Wake Awake. I think, I didn't look at it today. But I've used it in the past, and mm-hmm. uh, I think it's Denzer. If, wh- I remember it being very helpful, very good, where he just walks through the wake awake text and talks about the whole thing. Um, Is there boy, to my shame? I, I, I've heard some guys looking at like the Bach cantatas. Uh, are you familiar with looking at some of this for the the this particular text? Uh, yes. And I have done that. I, I do that on occasion and I've definitely done it with this, but I don't remember anything about it. Um, yeah. cause our choir sometimes sings this. Um, well, what are yeah, your I go-to I mean, such a, Well, I just haven't gone to them yet. I mean, they're just the ordinary things. I mean, it's just, you know, Luther's postals and, you know, maybe mm-hmm. the Gerhardt postal and, you know, some patristic yeah. stuff. You know, I, I don't have anything. I mean, it's not hard to find stuff. I mean, I used to use, I, I haven't used them in the last decade or maybe two decades, but I used to use Edersheim a lot. You ever mm. use, you ever read Edersheim? Yeah. He's not, yeah, he's, you know, what he's good for, he's not, he's not Lutheran, of course, but um, he does a really nice job of kind of telling the story and filling mm. in a lot of details and giving historical background. It's It's very accessible. You know, um, he was an Anglican, right? He was yeah. an Old Testament guy. Actually, for years, I actually thought he was a convert from Judaism. He, he's not, wasn't, but I don't know where I got that idea. So that's a good source. Um, you know, the what's that Catena? I can never remember the name of it. The, uh, you know, the Thomas Aquinas work where he has the patristic quotes. It's sort of like the uh, oh, yeah, ancient the, the golden, commentary. The golden ring. The golden or, thread. Yeah. Or go yeah. ring or what? Yeah, I don't know. Something like Aurelia that. Yeah, that, uh, it's like Katina. Like that. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's public domain. You can find that online if you wanted. If you, and uh, mm-hmm. that's just can be, it's, it's, the problem is it's like Aquinas doesn't always pick the best stuff, but at least he kind of gets you thinking about it and he gives mm-hmm. you sort of multiple ways. So that's kind that's of the my go-to. I like Aria. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, for, about for kind of an easy digest. Parsh, yeah, of course. I haven't looked at him for a long, but I used to, I mean, I devoured Parsh in my younger years, but I haven't picked him up in a long time. Even, you know, Herb Lindemann's The Sermon on the Proppers, he yeah. often has really good sermons in there, um, mm-hmm. either that he wrote or outlines, or, you know, a lot of times he'll have Lutheran Orthodox fathers in there. Um, mm-hmm. So those can be good too. Yeah, I'm sorry I'm not as... So this is a little bit early in my preparation process. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, for me, the next step after I talk to you is to go look at, maybe I should reverse this. Maybe I should do that earlier. But usually I do that after I talk to you. No, which is fine. I just was curious if you had anything from the past that you were like, you know, this is was a really helpful sermon that I read about this. Right. No, I should probably, but I just don't. Not at not the tip of my tongue. I did have a couple other, uh, the first Thessalonians 5 text, um, you know, has this great thing about keep sober, be awake. So, you know, that could be brought in if you go that way. Also in the Isaiah text, another sort of consoling thing is this, right? That you're not going to plant fields that somebody else sows. You're not going to build houses and have someone else live in them. There is this this promise in the new that the new heavens and the new earth are going to be the promised land where things are given for free and also where your labor is not in vain and and certainly the implication of not only going into the future but what you're doing now is more useful than you know and i think that's you know especially when you're suffering all sorts of setbacks and injustices and and sorrows that's an important promise as well uh, for the future. So, you know, what, what's it look like in that bridal chamber? Um, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, any final thoughts or did we cover it? Nope. That's, that's it. We covered it. Thank you. All right. Well, have a good one. We'll, we'll chat for Advent one. All right. Thanks, Jason. <laughs>